And of course, today we're going to be talking about the issue of whether a civil war is ever civil. And I will tell you that I'm what I, the description said that we would take a look at the English Civil War, at the Russian Civil War. I'm actually going to throw in the French Revolution because the French Revolution was a class based civil war among the three estates. So we're going to talk about that also. And given the amount of time that we have, since each of each of those topics could be a semester long class, and in most cases, each of them was a semester long class. Actually, Russian Revolution itself was a two semester class, which included uh, the Russian Civil War and one of my favorite things. So uh, if I need to, I will adjust what we're talking about next week a little bit then to come back and sort of look at it and talk about where are there similarities between the English Civil War, the, uh, the French Civil War, the French Revolution, the Russian Civil War, and then our own American Civil War? Because you know the one thing that is consistent with all civil wars, when you talk about a war that is occurring within the boundaries of a, an identified political state versus a nation, nation is, from a historical standpoint, the state, the political state, or the political nation, because people who talk about history or talk about politics don't always know the history. Nation is the people, state is, is the form of government or the, the geographic area by boundaries. Well, when you look at a civil war, civil wars by nature are much more destructive because the, the battle is where you can't get away from it. In most cases, civil wars are horrific. So that when we talk about the American Civil War, and we look at the number of casualties, we look at the number of permanent disabilities coming out of the American Civil War, we look at the destruction of, of agriculture, you know, railroads, trade, manufacturing, all those sorts of things. The cost of a civil war is always incredibly, incredibly expensive. And it's very personal because in a civil, a civil war, one of the things that we always see in history is that there really isn't a civilian population everybody is at war and everybody is forced to choose one side or the other. And I will say that if, if, for those of you that watch the news, whatever your news source is, whether you're reading it or you're watching it or you're listening to it, what we have seen in the last two days is that very sort of thing, even though, you know, the Ukraine is an independent recognized country at war with Russia, an independent recognized country. The truth of the matter is historically, there's always been this conflict over, are they indeed separate nations or are they as the Russians have alleged for a thousand years, part of the Russian state because there are Slavic people involved uh, in the Ukraine. Some because that's where they've always lived, some because they were relocated there during the Stalinist era. So anyway, let's jump in and, and we're gonna, uh, in a period of about 40 minutes, we're gonna do three civil wars and kind of take a look at, at what civil wars look like, why they're fought, and probably the most famous civil war and the civil war that in some ways is most like our American Revolution, which is, could possibly be considered a civil war, except geographically it doesn't fit the identifications. So technically, how do you define a civil war? So the next slide gives you what is the standard historical description of what a civil war is, and that's a violent conflict. It's not just an argument. It's not a disagreement. It's not even if you watch Japanese parliament on online or, or on PBS or whatever, it's not even the fisticuffs that sometimes occur in their national parliament, but it's when there is a violent conflict within a political state and with one or more groups of, of peoples, groups of political actors in most cases, because there's a difference of, of political opinions that usually are based on rights, responsibilities, economics, religion, all those sorts of things that occur in that state's territory. So that's how you define a civil war. So what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna very quickly lead you through, this could be called the uh, <clears throat> the abridged English Civil War, English or the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, but it's just some food for thought as we look at some of what's going on in the world today. I could just as easily probably have talked about Rwanda and the Hutu and the Tutsi, 
um, could have talked about what happens in Cambodia when Pol Pot is in power there. You know, was Vietnam in some ways a civil war, even though the political lines had been drawn differently by outsiders, so they were being acted upon? Yes, 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 and probably yes. But for our purposes, we're going to take a look at, uh, look at three of the most famous. So let's talk English Civil War for a moment. Um, I always love to talk English Civil War because it's just, it, you know, because so much of our political background, so much of our uh, political documents, our assumptions of rights and everything go back to England, the English Civil War is the one that we pay the most attention to. And the picture that I have um, up for you to see is that's King Charles I, who is a steward, who was the, the person in authority, in authority on the throne at the time of the English Civil War. So how would you define the English Civil War? Well, the English Civil War was something that had been erupting for a long, long time. There had always been a question about the rights of the government, the rights of the monarch. In fact, England is the first um, European country to really begin to deal with the issue of is is the monarch a divine rights monarch? And you probably remember from your studies in high school, or you know, you may not have had time to really talk about it in any great detail, but divine right monarchy assumes that the supreme being, the creator, God in his heaven is in control of everything that happens on earth. And therefore, if someone comes to power, if he, is, he or she is born into a family line that has control of the government and, and whatever that political state is, that that person rules by divine right, meaning that they rule by God's authority. Well, the English had questioned that fairly early, and most of you will remember 1215, June the 15th, 1215, on the plains at Runnymede, when you have the, the um, English lords, the English nobles, forcing King John I to sign the Magna Carta, which basically said that the king was not above the law, that there would be no taxation without representation, and this idea that there was a partnership in government. And that sets the tone in, in Britain, in England at that point. Of course, England will not technically become Britain until 1701 when Scotland is at it, but you know, they're, they're gaining territories this idea that there's some sort of a partnership. Well, that didn't always, even though that document had been signed, that wasn't always true. So, Cause you're gonna have monarchs between 1215 up until the 17th century, the 1640s that have disagreed with that. But we're gonna fast forward to talk a little bit about why the English Civil War occurred when it occurred. We're gonna do this and I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on the clock very, very quickly. Elizabeth I, had ruled effectively during that period that we know in history as the Elizabethan Golden Age. You know, her armies and navy had repulsed the Spanish during the Armada, which had tipped the balance of power in, in Europe and where Spain had been the dominant power for most of the 15th century and into the 16th century. What happens is by 1588, that's no longer the case. You know, the English are becoming that separate jewel in the North Sea, this political power, and on the continent, Spain is slipping from power and France is filling that void. But France is not a unified country at that point. So England really is the rising power. Well, Elizabeth rules for a long, long, long time. You know, it is Elizabeth who is on the throne when the Roanoke colony is established here. It is Elizabeth who gives the charter for Jamestown. Um, that's why Virginia is Virginia for the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. But she dies in 1603. And one of the things that Elizabeth had done that was probably wise while she was alive and ruling was that she had chosen never to marry because um, the, the monarchy, the tradition of the monarchy was pretty much across Europe male monarchy. And if a woman married, in many cases, she married obviously someone else of equal royal status. And that spouse would in most cases assume the throne and she would slip into that secondary position. Well, Elizabeth was not going to have any part of that. You know, I do love that Henry VIII marries all of these women trying to get this perfect son when he had this daughter that was so much more like him 
than his daughter Mary or his son Edward VI would ever have been. He has this strong ruler who is pragmatic, who makes her decisions on what's best for her people in her country. Well, she dies in 1603. And because she has never married, she has no heir. Now, at, toward the end of her life, she began to think about that. And she, you know, calculates as to who will come to her throne when she dies. And she knows that the throne will go to her cousins, the Stuarts in Scotland. Their mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, by the way, Elizabeth, or at least Elizabeth's advisors, had had executed because Mary was attempting to take Elizabeth's throne, claiming she was the legitimate heir because Elizabeth is by the second wife. And if there is no divorce, then the second marriage is not legitimate. Henry and his wives are just so much fun to talk about. But anyway, Elizabeth begins to groom James, the son, James the sixth of Scotland, who is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He, she begins to groom him through letters as to what, how he should rule when he comes to England. She dies in 1603. James VI of Scotland is invited to come to England and to rule. And apparently, James was like so many of our children when we're telling them, or our adopted children, when we're telling them how they should live their life, because he gets to England and he just pretty much promptly does everything that is the opposite of what Elizabeth has told him to do. He, in a speech to Parliament, will declare that he is a divine right monarch. He will... And sometime when you have time, it really is a fun speech to go read because he says things like, you know, just as God is the head of the church and the people are the body, just as, you know, he goes through all of these analogies and he basically says, you know, I am the head of the government and you all are my children. And of course, he's making this speech in parliament to, to a parliament that under Elizabeth, Elizabeth had... Um, she hadn't ruled equally with them, but she had done a really good job of making them think that they were in control because she would suggest or offer ideas and then say, but, you know, what do you think? And, and she would draw them into it. And then ultimately, by the time that the action occurred, it was their plan and therefore they bought into it. Well, James doesn't do any of that. Uh, he brings much pomp and circumstance to the court. The, the budget for the court is going to be outrageous. He uh, begins because his, he had been raised his early years in France. And even though he's gone to Scotland, which is a, a Presbyterian nature, nation under the, you know, under the doctrines primarily of John Knox, he'd been raised in the French court. So he is very popish, as they would say, and he really wants to embellish the Church of England. He, you know, Elizabeth had basically said, uh, I will not spy in anyone's heart, meaning if you're Catholic, I'm not going to bother you unless you're attempting to overthrow the government because you think I'm not the legitimate ruler. If you're a Presbyterian, if you're a Puritan, basically, I don't care. All of that begins to change when James comes to the throne, which is why we have the Pilgrims and the Puritans coming to this country early on. So just real, real quickly to kind of get us into the English Civil War, because I am looking at that clock. So James rules from 1603 until he dies in 1625. Now, James's lifestyle also is a little... Um, trying to think of how to say this in a PG way, but James's lifestyle is a little questionable because um, his closest advisor um, is also his very dear friend. And, um, you know, there's just all these things going on that, that the English and especially those of the uh, conservative religious sects are just appalled at. So the English Civil War, you know, James dies, his son Charles I comes to the throne. Charles I continues much of what his father has done, and, and he also uh, will attempt to rule without parliament. He comes to the throne in 1625. He needs money to support his lifestyle. You know, his father's friend had been the Duke of Buckingham, and the king had moved into Buckingham's palace. Charles will also be in Buckingham's palace, which will become part of the monarch's possessions. And Charles doesn't have enough money, so he calls Parliament. They will not give him what he wants unless he will agree in 1628 to something called the Petition of Rights. The Petition of Rights just basically said he could not raise taxes on his own and that he rules in coordination with Parliament. 
he becomes angry and dismisses Parliament, and he will not recall Parliament until 1640. Now, that's a period of, by the time he dismisses them, it's really 1629. So for a period of about 11 years, he is having his advisors go back and look at laws that are on the books that allow him to raise money through ways that haven't been used in some cases for centuries. Um, he has created a star chamber, which had not been used for almost three centuries. Uh, Henry II had used the star chamber and it was basically, instead of using the court system that had been created by parliament, it was the king's own court, own court system. And anyone who opposed him was brought before the star chamber that was pretty much a summary um, trial, judgment, execution, or at least banishment into the dungeons to, to live forever amongst the water with the rats gnawing on your toes and everything. And it's not until 1640 when the Scots become really angry because he has appointed into power um, Archbishop Laud. And Archbishop Laud is adding additional embellishments to the church. Well, since James is the ruler of England and Scotland, both in Scotland is Presbyterian for the most part. These embellishments where you have a book of common prayer, you have certain liturgy that has to be read on certain days, uh, robes, incense, colors, you know, all sorts of, lots of candles, all those sorts of things. And the Presbyterians in Scotland are sort of going, you know, this, this is not what we believe. You can't, you can't control the way that we worship. So they, as the Scots are often want to do, the Scots kind of gather together their people. They grab their horses. They grab their swords, even their broadsword steel. And they head toward, toward England, head south toward the border country and then across. And because Charles, Charles gets word they're coming and Charles calls Parliament because he doesn't have an army. When he calls Parliament, they yet once again begin to argue with him because they say basically that they're not going to raise an army for him unless he gives in to the demands of the members of Parliament. Now, so that takes us to who's serving in Parliament during this period of time because it's sort of interesting how things have changed. Um, what you're going to find is that you have a lot of the Puritans in Parliament and, and this whole issue of who is going to be in control forces two major questions that the English Civil War are going to be fought over. The two major questions are who's in control of the government? Is it the monarch, because he is indeed a divine right monarch, is it the king that's in charge of government, or is it parliament representing the will of the people? Now, let's be really honest when we say Parliament in the 1640s representing the will of the people. It's not, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry and George, the people. It is, for the most part, the rising middle class of merchants and traders and, you know, those who have speculated on foreign ventures and things. And it is the aristocratic uh, element. But it is who's going to be in charge of the government? Is it going to be this monarch who claims divine right and or is it going to be parliament? Question number one, who's in control of the government? Question number two is, who's going to be in control of the religious atmosphere of the nation? Are we going to be a, a country, a political entity where the religious practices of the citizens is dictated from the government? Or will this be a religious environment in which there may be a preferred state religion, but others are allowed to, to worship according to their own personal dictates and beliefs. Well, those are the two big questions. The, there's a third sort of question as to what's England going to do about Scotland, Ireland, and Wales? You know, how, how are, how, how's England going to govern those because that's sort of a mixed bag. You have the Presbyterians in Scotland, you've got the Catholics in Ireland, and then you have the Welsh, which have a very unique language, culture, and everything. So it, it's kind of fascinating. So anyway, um, 1641, Parliament insists that if Charles is going to have an army, then he has to make religious reforms. He has to replace all of his primary ministers and Charles refused. By 1642, he forces his way into the House of Commons. 
where he's going to attempt to arrest five members of parliament. There's a wonderful old movie, black and white, but oh my gosh, it's so good, called Cromwell, where Richard Harris stars as Oliver Cromwell. And it's pretty true, the, the coming into parliament is a very true depiction of what happens. By the way, that's why when Elizabeth goes to parliament now to address parliament, she cannot just enter, she has to stop and she has to go through a ceremony in which she knocks three separate times, each time being announced by the person, the, uh, I'm trying to think of what he's called, he's not the sergeant at arms in the English tradition, but anyway, he announces that the queen is at the door, she has to be invited into parliament. She can't just show up. And it comes from this instance uh, with Cromwell. So anyway, Charles I forces his way into the House of Commons. They had gotten word that he was coming. Cromwell and his men had already fled. Charles realizes that, oh boy, I have just created a war. He leaves London. He puts together his army, the parliamentary forces, put their army together. Charles and his men will be called the Cavaliers. That's why when you look at the mascot of the University of Virginia Cavaliers, they look like the Stuart monarchs of the 1600s in England that in fact, the Cavalier is actually Charles I, long curly hair, knee boots and everything. The parliamentary forces, because of the simplicity of their dress and their style, and they certainly don't have the long curly hair and everything, they are called the roundheads because um, they cut their hair very short so they can distinguish themselves uh, from those who are fighting on the Cavalier side. So, you know, are there battles that that most people who are there, they're studying the English Civil War, sure, but it's kind of like when we teach the Civil War anymore, we do major battles and we look at causes and results, but a couple of battles that probably you may have heard of, Edge Hill occurs early on, that's 1642, um, but there, both sides claimed a victory, but there really was a, a, a strong victory. Um, what's interesting is you know, everyone, a lot of the people are trying to stay neutral early on because they're not sure who's going to win and they don't want to be on the losing side. And especially if you, you are a more common person, you don't want to be the sacrificial lamb and all that's going to happen. But by 1643, pretty much everyone's had to choose a side. Uh, you have the Battle of Hopton Heath that occurs, the Battle of Newberry. Um, Oliver Cromwell, who puts together the new model army, is an absolutely masterful military leader. And as he begins to train his troops, he's kind of like, you know, we, we talked last week about Baron von Steuben. Cromwell is that same sort of disciplinarian, but he also just has a gift when it comes to um, knowing how to fight and knowing how to, uh, to force the issues and where are the strategic locations. Well, by 1644, the Scots have joined the Roundheads and the Scots are notoriously pretty serious fighters and they will heavily defeat the Cavaliers at the Battle of Marston Moor. I love saying Marston Moor. Uh, it gave them control of Northern England. And then the following, following year, um, Cromwell and his new model army, his professional soldiers are gonna defeat the Cavaliers at the Battle of Naseby. Um, Charles, bless his heart, had totally misjudged the Scots. He really believed that the Scots, because he was their king and his mother had been Scottish, that they would stay out of the war, but the Scots are the ones who will capture Charles. They will hand him over to parliament. Uh, he escapes briefly, and then there's more fighting, and then his supporters are defeated again at the Battle of Preston. That's why a lot of young boys in that era will be named Preston, because that's a significant battle that occurs in 1648. And when they are defeated, Charles will once again be turned over to Parliament, and for the first time in European history, you're going to have a sitting monarch declared to be guilty of waging war against his own people, and he will be executed in 1648. Regicide. Now, there had been lots of monarchs who had been killed, but they had been killed in battle, or they'd been killed in a coup d'etat, or whatever, but this, the idea of regicide, the idea of Charles I, even the other monarchs across Europe who didn't like him were pretty much shocked by what had happened. And Cromwell, 
in the name of the people will take control of the government. And he becomes first Lord Protector. There's a wonderful Monty Python song about Cromwell, Cromwell Lord Protector. Those of you who love Monty Python, which I do, you, you need to listen to it at some point, but he becomes Lord Protector initially. Um, he is ruling and then he strengthens those powers in 1653 and he actually will rule for a period of about eight and a half years in the place of a king and he attempted to make it a military puritan rule so you know it just was an absolute disaster so when it's all over what have they accomplished well there is this idea that parliament is in control but kind of fast forwarding and and it's fun to look at and talk about. So Cromwell will die. His son Richard will come to the throne, come to be Lord Protector for a short period of time. Richard is a dud, bless his heart. He's just inapt. And Parliament on their own will invite Charles the first surviving son, Charles the second, who is in exile in France to come back to England and to rule. And Charles will come back and he will rule then and will rule in fact, he will rule from, you know, until 1685, at which point he dies, his younger brother James II comes to the throne and will rule until 1688 when the English, the English glorious revolution occurs and you have the, the total power in England pass over to parliament with the, with the English Bill of Rights. No, and of course, remember they don't have a constitution but they have a Bill of Rights. So, English Civil War, did it accomplish what they wanted it to accomplish? Well, yes, but it took 60 years to get there. What we'll takes it until 1688 to really accomplish it? So I guess that's, that's more like 45 years or whatever. So um, now how does that compare to the French Revolution? And oh my gracious, when we talk French Revolution and we're gonna do it very, very quickly, because the French Revolution, I think, is for many people considered to be the major turning point. In fact, when we divide European history, if you're teaching modern Europe, you tend to start you know, with the, the late Middle Ages, beginning of the high Middle Ages, 1200. And historians, you know, that the first half is from high Middle Ages until the beginning of the French Revolution, 1789. Second half is 1789 forward, even though that's not an equal division of years, but it's an equal division of, for the most part, political ideas and, and what happens there. Well, I've got several pictures up there for you because in theory, the first stage and maybe the second stage of the French Revolution is a civil war. And then because the, the stages are, of course, the first is the revolution occurs. And we'll talk real quickly about why it occurs. It's interesting to see what motivates people to take up arms against their own government. Second stage is the reign of terror. And I think we all are very familiar with the reign of terror because that's you know the fun part in the movies where you see people being dragged up to the guillotine and then you hear that and that's the stage two. Stage three is the Thermidorian reaction, which is what when sort of those people who are involved in the revolution look at each other after two years of the reign of terror, almost two years of the reign of terror and go, what the heck are we doing? We have become, we have put on the robes of those that we have deposed, which is one of the famous quotes. So that reaction shifts and coming out of the Thermidorian reaction, of course you have the rise of Napoleon and, and the empire, which is so funny because Louis XVI, who will be put out, executed along with his wife, and be replaced ultimately when Napoleon comes to the throne. Napoleon is married to to uh, to Marie Antoinette's niece, the daughter of her brother, who is the ruler of Austria. So they simply switched rulers, and in many ways, Napoleon will be a much more firm monarch than Louis the Sixteenth had ever been. So just a couple of quick things. To remember about the French Revolution, and that's that. You know, why does it ever, why does it even occur? And that's because, you know, you'd had Louis the Fourteenth, who was the longest ruling monarch in French history. He's on the throne for seventy-two years, from the age of five. Now he has a regency, but he takes control of the government when he is about twelve or thirteen. If you read the documents that 
he really begins to, to talk about and write about, and he rules until his death. So 72 years on the throne, he has outlived his son, his grandson, when he dies, it is his great grandson, Louis the 15th, who will come to the throne. And then his son, Louis the 16th, will come to the throne. And both of them are going to be incredibly weak rulers simply because Louis the 16th had ruled in so many ways by himself. Um, he had not called the Estates General, which was the representative body, which would have been parliament for the French parliament meant to talk about that's their court system. So the Estates General is their legislative body. Well, when Louis the 14th is a young boy, his mother um, dismisses the Estates General so that he will be able to rule alone. And for 175 years from 1614 until 1789, the Estates General doesn't meet. Now, what are some of the other problems? Well, you know, at the period of time that we're talking about, there is France had gone through two winters of horrible food production, um, just have been devastating. There's famine, you know, there's not the food production. So the, there's a high price of bread, low wages for the workers. Um, lots of families are simply starving to death, which made those who were the peasants dislike the rich nobles who seem to have the money to be able to eat well. You know, I've always told folks, if you study history, the one thing you don't ever want to do is get the mamas upset because their babies are starving to death. How is France divided into social systems? They're divided into three estates. That's why the legislative body is called the Estates General. And you have basically the first estate, which are the priests, and they, um, you know, they are the ones who pray. You have the second estate, which is the nobility, and they represent from two to three percent of the population. The priests, by the way, represent one to two percent of the population. You know, France is a very heavily Catholic nation. And then you have the third estate, which is pretty much everybody else, and they are from 95 to 97 percent of the population. The third estate includes everyone from the poorest, poorest, poorest peasant all the way to doctors, lawyers, university professors, anyone who is not of noble blood and who is not within the church and within the brotherhood of the church. Um, that division, that lack of voice in government for those who are well-educated, who understand the law, who have new and novel ideas, I guess that's redundant, new ideas about how things can be done, really creates a problem. Plus you have the Roman Catholic Church, which owned most of the land in France, and they had put a tax on all the agricultural crops that was called the dime, which was a tithe, and that had hurt the poorest and those who were the hungriest, and that creates resentment. And, you know, education, you have among this third estate, the upper members of the bourgeoisie within the third estate who are well-educated are reading the works of the enlightened philosophers. They're reading John Locke. They're reading Montesquieu, French. They're reading Voltaire, French. They're reading Rousseau, French. And they're wondering why they're not allowed to have a voice in the government because they see themselves as being as well equipped, if not better equipped than those who are incredibly wealthy. So, you know, what happens? 1789, Louis XVI finds himself, as Charles I had found himself in 1640 when he finally relinquishes and calls Parliament, Louis XVI actually in 1786 will put out the word that he's going to call um, the Estates General back into force. And it because they hadn't met in 175 years, it took a period of about three years for them to figure out who would represent each of the provinces, who, who were going to be those delegates. So he calls them together in 1789. And they um, the members of the third estate immediately are angry and they demand that they have a larger voice. The way the estates are seated, each estate had 600 delegates. So there are 600 members of the clergy, there are 600 of the nobility, there are 600 representing 
the 95% to 97% of the population that's the third estate. Um, Louis the 16th, bless his heart, is so frightened by the fact that the third estate's asking for re equal representation or representative apportioned representation that he just locks the doors to the estates general, assuming that they will not, they'll all get frustrated and they'll go home. They don't. Instead, they they run to the ten, outdoor tennis courts that have been built by Louis the Fourteenth, and they, you know, take the pledge of the tennis court oath, Abby Saez and others saying that they will not stop meeting until they have a constitution and they declare themselves to be the National Assembly. And of course, all heck breaks out from there. Uh, we won't talk about all the details, but just remember there's the storming of the Bastille, which is to, considered to be Fran French Independence Day. You know, the National Assembly will time after time after time, you know, they're, they're going to attempt to gain control of the government. They're going to abolish feudalism. They're going to, uh, they're going to, de-Catholic the church, which is uh, in effect what it basically is doing is that they're going to declare themselves to be a non-religious nation for a period of time. They're going to have a civil constitution in which all the clergy have to agree that they are now employees of the state and therefore whoever is in control of the government is to whom they look for guidance. And of course, that's absolutely a nightmare in a very devoutly uh, Catholic nation. But what you have is, you know, the, the French royal family will attempt to flee Paris. They will be captured at the border on their way to Austria with secret letters in Marie Antoinette's petticoats. And they will be brought back to France. And ultimately, during the reign of terror, uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette will both be executed. He in the spring, she following in October. Um, there's a September massacre that occurs where those, um, it, there's fear that if the revolution doesn't succeed, that the feudal bonds will be put back in place and peasants will continue to be uh, tied to the land. So there will be an overthrow of a lot of the wealthy families and the documents will all be burned. And then you have this, this seizing of the power because there's conflict going on and everyone's looking for a leader. You have three men that step forward and take control and they are Maximilien Robespierre, Georges Dante, and Jean-Paul Marat. Uh, Robespierre is the organizer. He's the, the thinker. Don, Danton is the spokesperson. He's the one unattractive man, uh, but just mesmerizing speaker, and Marat is the writer. He's the one who today would be handling all their press releases and their social media, and and he knows how to stir the masses. And they will, um, under Robespierre's leadership, they will begin to eliminate all of the opposition. And that's the reign of terror. And we know that in the reign of terror, which lasts for almost a year and a half, um, it's hard to know exactly how many people will be executed, but it was pretty much anyone who had someone point a finger at them and said they were, you know, they were allies of the nobility. They were, you know, they had, in, in many cases, it was people who simply worked for the nobility. And if you were poor, who were you going to be working for other than the nobility? Tell of Two Cities, wonderful way of, of reading, obviously, a, a novel, but a take on the French Revolution. Well, when they finally come to their senses with the uh, Thermidorian reaction, then, of course, uh, the coup that occurs on 18 Brumar uh, brings Napoleon to power. And then we go in to a period in which Napoleon pretty much will begin to single-handedly rule the country again, first as part of the consul, then as first consul. And then in 1803, he will declare himself to be dictator, um, emperor for life and will crown himself on the steps of the Notre Dame. So, I mean, it's just wild. Now, how does that compare to the Russian Revolution? And I've saved the Russian Revolution for last because that's what, for those that are gonna be able to, to attend or listen tomorrow night, and for what you're hearing so much about in the news in the last day or two, 
the Russian Civil War really, and historically the Russians considered the Civil War to be 1917 to 1920. That's not really how I always taught it. You know, this is how the Russians themselves look at it. I look at the Bolshevik Revolution occurring in 1917 and the Civil War really not beginning until late 1918 and it continuing technically until 1922, but with most of the fighting pretty much over by the time we get into about 19, late 1920, early 1921. So um, what causes the Russian Civil War? You know, how does it differ? The English Civil War is a question of who's ruling the government and who's in control of making certain that rights for example, religion are protected. French Revolution is a civil war. It's a class-based civil war. And again, it's over issues of what are the rights of the individuals, who can speak in government, those sorts of things. And the Russians would tell you that that's what the Russian Revolution of 1917 is all about, the Bolshevik Re Revolution, as we uh, call it. Um, the Russian Revolution had been brewing for a long, long time. Uh, it had begun with a lot of the czarist tactics during the 19th century, quite frankly, the pogroms where those who were in opposition either religiously or politically, Siberia had become a place where you sent those who were political uh, opponents, you sent them off to work in the salt mines, which was a horrific way of dying, you know, working in the mines all the time literally dehydrated the body and most of those who worked in the salt mines were lucky if they had a year or two of life. Um, and it had intensified, there had been a couple of attempts to um, overthrow the czar in the early 20th century, but, and, and two different times the czar uh, had promised, Nicholas when he came to the throne had promised that he would allow a constitution to be written, but he doesn't follow through on that. So by the time we get to the Great War, World War I, Russia's really poor performance in the Great War is gonna be a major contributing factor to why the Russian Civil War occurs when it does. Um, and you have to remember that Russia during the Great War, it's hard for us to have exact numbers, but we believe that the Russians lost somewhere close to 20 million people as a result of the Russian Civil War. Now, most of those are gonna be civilian casualties and that's because of disease, it's because of, of uh, not enough food, because the Russian economy could not support the war. The czar didn't have, you know, did not have the financial ability to support the war. He ordered, one of the things that will make Nicholas so unloved by his people, in addition to the extravagance and affluence with which the Tsar Tsarina, their four daughters, and the, uh, the crown prince will live, is the fact that, you know, they're living such lush lives, and yet he's sending troops into battle in World War I who have, muni have guns in some cases, but no bullets but they are told to charge using bayonet charges only. Um, it is such an absolute disaster that in 1918, as a part of the Bolshevik revolution, the overthrow of the czar, that, and the negotiation begins in 1917, Lenin, the, the Bolshevik revolution will be led by Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. Again, an interesting trio because Lenin is the face of the revolution. Stalin is the hammer of the revolution. He's considered to be the force. Trotsky is the intellectual, but Trotsky will also be the one who will lead the Red Army. He's a military strategist, absolutely brilliant, um, but he is a little different than Lenin and Stalin. And Lenin obviously takes the front seat in all of this. Well, to get out of the war, the Russians had to agree to a treaty and it will be the Russian military that signs the treaty with the Germans. And it's a treaty that signed in 1918 in which basically Russia loses about a third of their farmable land. They lose large amounts of their population. It just really is a disastrous, disastrous 
treaty, they lose what today we would consider to be the uh, the provinces along their southern border. They lose Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Uzbekistan. They lose Georgia. They lose part of the Ukraine, which is their outlet to warm water. They lose the Baltic provinces for the most part in this treaty. And of course, it creates a split among the revolutionaries. So you're going to have the non-Bolshevik left is going to then join with the left socialist revolutionaries. And they are then going to join with the Russian whites who had control of the volunteer army more to the east. And then they're going to be fighting against the Red Army, which is the Bolshevik army that's going to be led by Trotsky. Um, and the Red Army's ultimate purpose is they see the revolution really centering around this rise of nationalist influence, the Ukrainians, the, uh, the Georgians in many cases, um, those along the southern borders who are the non-Russians and their civil war in many ways becomes a fight between predominantly Russian Slavs versus non-Russian Slavs and other minority groups that have been brought into the Russian empire since the days of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Uh, now the white army real quickly, we don't have much time left, but the white army is fascinating because it's this unusual thing. So you've got these socialist revolutionaries who are not Bolsheviks, along with the rightist white army that's led by Antoine uh, Deninkin, who is their general, joining with forces that are going to come in from outside. And this is one of the things that's really interesting in the Civil War, because technically a Civil War should be uh, totally fought internally, not with outside forces. And yet, you know, in the American Civil War, the South certainly was looking and hoping that England might get involved on their side, um, probably would have taken support from others too. Well, the White Army is going to be joined by a lot of Western forces. And the Western, the reason the Western forces are going to join the White Army is two reasons. One, the fact that Russia has pulled out of the Great War, pulled out of this fight against Germany, Austria, Hungary in particular, that means that Germany is no longer fighting a two front war and, and we wanted to keep Germany in that vice of a two front war. So you've got to have the white army win, take back control of the Russian government so that Russia will get back in the war. Purely military strategy. The other thing is the Western world, having read Marx, you know, Des Capital and, and his other, you know, the Communist Manifesto and everything, they are scared cross-eyed of this spread of socialism, communism, as it will be interpreted by Lenin, this idea of a worldwide revolutionary of, of workers that would overthrow the bonds and chains that imprison you. So they're very frightened. In March of 1918, Britain will send military forces to join the white army. In April, the Japanese send forces. The Japanese also are very leery that, and they should have been, because you know they have several times in the past uh, come to odd over the Sakhalin Islands uh, with Russia, you know, that control, that access to warm water in the Pacific, you know, that's the reason that Vladivostok even exists as a port, so Russia would have an outlet, that's the reason for the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So the Japanese are involved, they're, they're very nervous about what's going on there. Then you've got um, an element of the Austrian-Hungarian army that had surrendered to the Russians that are Czech and Slavic, that had been promised because they're Czech and Slavic, that they would be given safe passageway back home just to stay out of the war. And the Russians decide they're not gonna do that, which then ticks off the Czechs and the Slavs who then join the white army. And then the United States sends 12,500, the records say, we don't know whether that's, that there were more, but we know that's what the records say, 12,500 troops to actually fight with the white army. Um, we're about to run out of time. But ultimately what happens is that um, Trotsky is in charge of the Red Army. Of course, um, they are much more well-equipped because they have control of Moscow, the center of government. They um, 
the Bolsheviks will announce their own red terror against those who they believe have infiltrated their ranks, who are not supportive of the Bolshevik revolution and this vision for what the new uh, Russia is going to look like. And there will be a period of time, Stalin will be the one who will lead most of this in which all agitators will be arrested. The Cheka, which is the secret police at this period of time, is rampant across uh, the Russian territories and anyone who is considered to be a non-Slavic agitator or simply a political agitator, they will be arrested, tried and executed. And that, that red terror is what leads to the czar and his family being executed in July of 1918 because their fear is if the white army succeeds, they will simply put Nicholas II back on the throne. Again, 1919, you have the Red Army invades Ukraine. You have the, um, the White Army will join with Ukrainian freedom fighters to repel the Reds. There's a ceasefire. French forces then will land at Sebastopol, which is the Crimea. And you can kind of see Sebastopol on the map down here with the Black Sea. You have the French landing there. And now the question is, um, you know, what's going to happen? And the reality is we can't, simply can't, we can't continue. The, the White Army doesn't have enough strength to continue. The Red Army has control of most of those access ports and, and the Red Army will be victorious. Lenin will declare that we now have a new nation. He will bring back in those provinces that have been attempting to get away from the Russian empire, including the Ukraine, including Georgia, where Stalin is actually Georgian by birth, and those others, and he will declare a new Russian federated socialist state, which will morph uh, in 1922 into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and of course Lenin's dead by 1924, Stalin comes into power, and it's a whole new ball game. Now Stalin is, you know, we talk so much about Hitler because I think we have closer connections to the horror of the final solution and, and the multitude of, of people, predominantly the Jewish people, but you know, a lot of other people that, that Hitler targets. And yet Stalin, um, we believe probably in the 1930s alone is gonna execute more than 20 million people. And if you take it up through his final period, probably somewhere around 33 million people that he will execute, including every member of the Red Army that had remembered Trotsky. And of course, he will, his henchmen will follow Trotsky all the way to Mexico City, where he will be with Diago Rivera and, and Freya, Frida, and he will be, Trotsky will be executed by having an ice pick driven through his ear. You know, Lenin dies has a stroke and then ultimately will die. But, but Stalin in the 1930s will kill everyone who has ever served in the army who knew either Trotsky or Lenin. He will execute everyone within the Russian army rank of lieutenant and above because it means they've been in the army for some period of time and then he will seek out all the others so that it what happened in Russia with the civil war gaining control of the government is so very different than what you find in France. You know, France has this, this overthrow of the government and then they sort of come to their senses and you know, they, they will muddle around during the 19th centuries for the love of heaven. They just have a terrible time trying to figure out their form of government, but they sort of get back on course. The English, because they're calm, cool and, and collected, except when they're not, will come out of the English Civil War, out of the Glorious Revolution into a period of time where they are able to become the most dominant power in the world. The Russians, you know, it's, they're gonna struggle with trying to keep together this nation of many ethnic minorities who choose not, you know, from the Cossacks to the Azerbaijanians, from the Ukrainians, you know, all the way to the Manchurians in some cases. Um, they're gonna have a terrible time trying to hold together this nation that they have pieced together as a result of, of their revolution, of their civil war. And it's not gonna be pretty. <laughs>
and it still is not pretty. And we'll talk more about that later, but that sort of gives you three of the major civil wars in more modern history to think about. And then we will talk a little bit next week when we start class a little bit about the American Civil War, because when you look at our Civil War as compared to especially Russia and France, our Civil War is horrific as it is, even though it is the largest number of casualties of any um, war in which the United States has found itself involved, it still pales in comparison to what especially occurs in France and in Russia. And you know we'll we'll take a look and talk just real quickly about you know how how you look at our civil war, the lasting legacy of it probably is as important today as the legacy of any of those others that we've talked about today. So we'll start there next week. But some great movies out there, some absolutely wonderful books out there to read. Um, you know, if you're interested even in how World War I will sort of trigger the Russian Revolution and ever, um, and all of the other things that occur, you know, Guns of August is a wonderful Barbara Tuckman, wonderful look at the entire impact that the First World War will have on what happens in the 20th century. A lot of great books out there about the French Revolution, you know, the English Revolution. I'll send a list so that they can post those to you. And um, I think I saw a question come up, something about China. Let me take a look at that because that's in, why is China, China not condemning Putin? Um, you know, I have to tell you as a historian, I have always thought that where it will be dangerous is if ever the bear and the dragon go to war against each other. They are both, even though today Russia would not say that it is a communist nation, but there is the rise of communism again in the nation. And Putin carries many of those ideological actions in what he does. And we know that Maoist communism, that as it was manifested in China, is a very different form, um, was a much actually more brutal form of communism as he interprets um, Marx and uh, the People's Revolution and the Flower you know, all of that. Um, but I think that, that you will find from a historical standpoint that the Chinese and the Russians, while they dislike each other with great vigor, they dislike all of us more than they dislike each other. It really comes back to, and, and I made this statement I, on one of the Facebook posts, it is unfortunate that the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend because then you sometimes end up with major powers who both have the potential to be pretty scary. The idea that they might ever ally themselves, that China might take courage from what Putin is doing in the Ukraine to attempt a similar action on Taiwan. And I mean, Taiwan has been in a precarious situation since 1948 and the people there live in constant fear of being brought back in um, to mainland China. You know, they are, they are nationalist China, the government in exile on the island of Formosa, Taiwan. It, it's kind of a scary time. I can't decide whether it's better to watch the news every day and go, hmm, or to not watch and not be aware of what's going on. The historian in me can't not watch. You know, it's kind of like the car wreck on the side of the road. So we will keep talking about how history, how the past predicts the future. That's why we should know our history is you know, if we really paid attention, sometimes the small signs would give us a hint as to what's going to happen. And having said that, I'm turning it back over to you, Jennifer, because it is four, according to my clock, it's 432, which means on your clock, it's probably 434, because I think you're ahead of me. Yeah, I'm a few minutes ahead. So yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that uh, talk today. I thought it was super interesting. And um, again, remember tomorrow at 5.30 at the Downtown Library, plus on uh, live streaming on YouTube, 
Linda's going to talk about Ukraine and Russia and that whole situation. And next week on March 8th, the topic is going to be reconstruction and unconstructing the reconstruction. So we'll talk about a little bit about the Civil War and the aftermath. So, Absolutely. so I don't see any questions in the chat. So you all have a lovely evening. Have yeah. fun. The sun's shining out there. It looks like a good time to run out and fill your bird feeders. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here and we'll see you either tomorrow or next week. So bye-bye. Bye. See you, everybody.